away from the armor now. Um, got to change the color using a Createx Illustration uh, sepia. So these uh, severed heads that I'm working on now are going to have a an orange wash over them. So I picked the sepia to be the, the best mid-tone, um, best, uh, best color to use to build up all the detail. Um, yeah, with the sepia, it's quite a good good paint to use because um, with enough passes, and if you've got the the paint thick enough, so um, not so reduced, with multiple passes, you can actually um, create almost a black look. So, without using black, um, you can use the sepia to create that really dark, uh, those dark lines, as uh, you'll see in this video. Um, every now and then, I'll switch to a thicker mix. So I'll um, at the moment I'm working with a reduced mix so that I can slowly build up these um, these textures and these details um, but every now and then I'll switch to a, a darker mix so I'll just add a little bit more sepia to my mix uh, stir it up um, and that way I can actually produce some thicker darker lines uh, something a little bit more solid um, just to block in those uh, those darker areas so yeah like I said at the moment just working my way around this, um, just drawing in the details, drawing in textures, um, just taking note of my reference to make sure I get it as, as close as I can. I'm not going to get it exact because uh, it's almost near impossible because there's that much detail in this original reference picture. But um, the closer I get it, the better. So, I, again, like I did with the armor, I'm starting off fairly light. Just building that foundation up. You can see I've got um, pretty much most of the heads drawn in there um, using um, a graphite transfer. So what I what I did for this whole piece, which I haven't explained in the previous videos, is um, I've taken my reference picture and on the back of that I've actually rubbed uh, lead pencil. So I've uh, over the whole thing rubbed, rubbed lead pencil. I've then flipped it back over and redrawn the outlines back onto that um, the UPA paper and that gives me my um, well as much detail as I could put on there it gives me all my outlines then what I do is I will erase them as much as I can till they're barely visible um, because sometimes the lead pencil can actually mix in with the colors and muddy it up a bit so the lighter the better it's it's most of the time I work with a, a ref like a, um, a base drawing that is barely visible even to me um, and I, I like it that way that way I know that the lead pencil is not going to interfere uh, with the paint at all so there was a lot of detail in the um, the facial features on this reference picture so uh, this was quite a quite a challenge to, to get it as close as possible like I said it's not going to be exact because um, I'm looking at a reference picture on a tablet that's um, probably half a meter away so you know trying to transfer that back onto my project keeping that fresh in my mind after I've just looked at it um, not the easiest of tasks but uh, I felt I got there in the end so here is as I was explaining a bit earlier um, I've added a bit more paint to my sepia mix and you can see I'm creating darker lines which um, almost almost come up as black and that's I think I've mentioned in previous the previous videos that I don't really use a black to create any of my shadows or my detail um, because the black tends to flatten out too much um, so what I do is I'll I'll use a color that sort of mixes well with what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do so like I said this is going to have an orange wash over it so the sepia mixes well with the orange because the sepia has a yellow tone to it. Um, so with this, and because the sepia can actually um, go quite dark, um, I can use that as my base, and the orange will actually wash over that really well. Um, and I can also erase my highlights back into this sepia as well. Um, you can also use a, a white mix on top of the sepia as well. Um, uh, showing. Uh, the next video is that I choose to use a old bone white because um, the old bone white has a slight bit of 
a brown tint to it. So it kind of helps somewhat with the, the blue shift. Uh, not completely, but a little bit. So with this, I don't need to be too careful with uh, making sure everything's perfect because as you can see there, I can scratch uh, highlights back in. So if I um, get overspray, so like I did on the tooth just there, that's fine. I can I can scratch that white back in and um, basically have a clean slate again. And you'll notice I do this every now and then. I'll, I'll just put the airbrush down and switch to my um, th the uh, the sharpened paintbrush um, and just and just knock some of those uh, little details back in. Um, it's good to do that while um, the painting's kind of on the lighter side um, because any mistakes you could you've, you've got multiple layers to go to to cover that back over and blend those sharp details back into the image to soften them up. I actually really enjoyed this part of the project because this is probably a bit more my style. Um, it's almost like drawing with the airbrush because um, all the details are, you know, so fine and finicky. Whereas with the um, the armor, it was all about texture. So and there was so much of it in the armor, or the chainmail sort of got some of it got a little bit tedious. But um, you know, this is it's sort of almost like feels like a bit of freedom really, because um, you just. Yeah, just freehand it with the airbrush anything goes really like I said make any mistakes you can always erase it back no problems there and essentially yeah I'm just I'm just drawing at the moment with the airbrush which is um, one of my favorite things to do um, and I've probably mentioned this before but this particular airbrush the I want a HP SB plus is incredibly good for high detail work um, it just it can pull them at the finest lines now I've got a, a micron a I want a custom micron CMC plus um, which is an amazing airbrush as well um, but I just uh, I don't find the need for it because um, this this airbrush can do everything that the, the micron can do um, I do intend on bringing the micron micron out one day um, but uh, it's just <laughs> it's just so expensive to fix, and I'm uh, quite clumsy with my airbrushes. So I found a happy medium with this airbrush. It's uh, relatively cheap to to repair, um, and it's just it just pulls the most uh, incredibly fine lines. Also atomizes really well um, when you're spraying larger areas. The only downfall is is the Obviously the cup's kind of small and it has no lid, so it's uh, you'll notice I swap across to my a cup, I think it's the HP CH, I swap over to a little bit later, um, just so I can load the airbrush with more paint. So like I said, the only downfall with this brush is that. I'm just laying a piece of paper down because uh, I don't want my hands to rub off any of that uh, textures that I've been working so hard on with the armor. Definitely don't want any mistakes at this stage because uh, I don't want to be backtracking and trying to fix things up. So uh, already a lot of hours put into this so far. You see, I'm trying to scratch some hair textures into into that paint that I've laid down there. Um, but I think I've mentioned this before. The Upo paper can be a little bit unforgiving if the paint's left on there too long and it won't scratch in too well so uh, sometimes the best option is to actually paint uh, some of the hair in with with a white paint over top of uh, what I've already laid down um, unfortunately like I said it does sometimes create a bit of blue shift but uh, I can counteract that with my orange wash uh, orange being pretty much the opposite of the of the blue it does counteract that shift in color and you see I'm slowly systematically darkening this piece up and it's just really starting to come to life 
once you get those um once you block those uh shadows in and I, I absolutely love the sepia tone for that just the ability just the the range of um tones it has from a very light yellowish brown misting that you can do with a very over reduced mix uh, to the opposite end of the, end of the scale where you can actually create almost a black like I have just there at the, the back of the head so it's such a versatile paint to use so here I'm I've slowed this down a touch because I want to show you what one of the techniques I tried which is to lay down a, a very light misting of the, the sepia and while it's still wet use a fan tail uh, sorry a fan tip brush and the downstrokes to create to create um, the impression of hair and it worked quite well so um, that's the paintbrush that I've been using so you can see the end of it's actually um, it's caked with paint so um, a lot of those the ends are just quite hard and um, they're not they're not soft anymore so it, it's very good for scratching out um, you know, something that looks like hair it didn't work completely how I planned but it was it was good enough for a foundation something to work over and like I said that is going to get worked over quite a lot so that area that I just laid down is going to be almost black anyway so um, it just gives me a guide You can see things starting to come uh, shape up now. There's um, the ropes that are holding the heads together. They're starting to take form. Just working in some of those sharper details, some of the fibers in the rope. So there I go with the paintbrush technique again. So you can see it's not, hasn't really worked to plan, but so resorting to the end of the paintbrush now. Uh, like I said going back over that anyway it's going to hide most of that they're all subtle details that probably won't be noticeable to uh, to, to the eye if you're if you're looking at it from say a meter away half a meter away but once you get in close you do start to see those little um, those little, tiny little details just adds to the effect really yeah, giving another go so paints probably a little bit too dry to be trying that technique now I have heard that the um, the other synthetic papers like the Drew Blair paper is much much easier to use so uh, the window of time you have to erase like that is is much larger you can see I've left uh, the forehead of that that head on the left uh, reason for that is in the reference picture that's actually uh, catching a lot of the light the um, the moonlight that's coming through so that's all that's got a, um, a blue tint to it um, it's actually even got a little bit of um, purple which um, I'll, I'll use a red violet for that along with the the um, Payne's gray um, and that that'll that'll come up quite nice and that'll represent the um, you know the, the highlights that are caught on the on the surface of the head from the moon
So this head um, actually on the reference picture is a little bit more washed out because uh, at the very bottom right of this picture um, there's a lot of glare coming up from um, the secondary source of light which is the well you can't see them in the picture but flames um, so the bottom right hand corner um, is basically the light source is going to be from the fight from a fire so you know the the face closest to the fire is quite washed out because a lot of the lights actually um, is washing over that uh, if you understand what I mean um, it loses a lot of detail from from basically the glare whereas the head on the left is um, just a little bit further away so needs a lot more detail put into it it'll start to make a bit more sense once I add those colours in a little bit further down the track but it's these steps now where I'm actually just thinking ahead uh, to make sure I don't push too much detail into it because um, then you know I have to try and push that back again when I bring the light source in um, so setting the picture up ready for that is um, just makes my life a little bit easier down the track obviously being a little bit closer to the light source um, there's not going to be as much um, dark detail so this head was a little bit a um, little bit lighter and a little bit easier to do So I um, added, spent a little bit of time adding more paint to the mix there, so just so I can come in and darken things up, uh, just kind of tidies things up here. I can uh, add a little bit of a, a border, a bit of a darker line to sort of border, uh, especially the the rope coming around there into the mouth. Just gives me an idea on where my painting's at. So essentially, I've, I've you know jumped a step ahead but um, that's fine because I'm I'm still using the same color um, and it's just to see where this is going um, it's as easy as adding more reducer again so I can go back to my over reduce mix to continue on with all the, the textures um, just every now and then I like to jump ahead add, add some really dark details in just to um, just gives me an idea um, keeps it exciting as well because you can see where it's going as you can see I've I've uh, reduced the mix again so fairly over reduced um, again I would probably say it's uh, around about 70% um, reduced to 30% paint um, maybe 60 60 40 but um, it's it's around that area And some instances, I probably even get to about 80% uh, reduced to 20% paint um, if I want a really light, uh, subtle textures. Uh, problem with that, though, sometimes you can be a little bit too lean, a little bit too reduced, um, and when you're right in close, 
um, it, it's pumping out more reducer than paint and it can tend to separate the paint that's already on your uh, the UPO paper so it, it might actually just like push the paint away because essentially you just you just spraying reducer onto the page um, so you just got to be careful of that um, it's no big deal especially in a piece like this because it's so detailed uh, any little mistake is is easy to fix easy to cover I should say not so much fix but you can cover things I find these these pieces are probably the easiest to work on because you can really you can make so many mistakes and I do I make so many mistakes but I'm able to hide them so anything a lot more simple than this um, where it, you know you've got to lay down a flat color um, you make one mistake and it's it's really hard to fix without uh, making it look like you know there's there's two different tones to the paint. Now, if you drop a bit of color over something that's supposed to be you know a uniform color you know you're going to try and blend that in it's really hard whereas this um, just turn it into something else just make it into another wrinkle or another feature another important thing to do with the sepia and probably the Payne's Grey is mix it every now and then just shake it up every now and then because um, I don't know if you notice there but sometimes the paint because uh, there's different colors in the sepia there's it um, I assume there's a yellow tint to it those colors are, do settle as you're painting and can separate so you might end up with a, a darker brown mix rather without the yellow in it so it's good to just shake it up every now and then to keep those colors nicely mixed so you don't end up with two different tones um, if you were to leave a, a bottle mixed overnight and you come back you'll find that the two, there's a couple of colors that have separated um, so at the very bottom I think you probably I think it is uh, the dark really dark brown that you'll find and on the top you'll find a lighter yellowish kind of a brown um, and if they're separated then you're gonna end up with a real dull brown that comes out of your, your gun rather than the nice yellowy tinted mix that the CP usually has. So again I'm spraying at uh, 25 psi round about there. Um, I don't change the psi at all throughout this whole piece because um, because uh, it's so detailed there's there's really no need to to crank the pressure up you know I don't want um, spider webbing or you know I don't need to lay down large amounts of paint anywhere so it's it's not really necessary um, I think for the background because I, I did actually forget to record the background um, not so much forget I just probably didn't really think about it at the time so I think for the background I actually did up the pressure because that was such a a large area and was you know hardly any detail in it and it was all supposed to be you know semi out of focus just for, for depth um, so that's fine to, to crank up the pressure for those sort of um, instances but when it comes to detail like this it's best to lower your pressure uh, reduce your mix as much as you can before it gets to the point where you can you know you're barely laying down a line and, and then work back from that and add paint as you need. So, <laughs> clearly I lost a bit of footage there every now and then my phone would just stop out of nowhere something I'd run out of memory or battery sometimes runs out so sorry about that but it's pretty much the same stuff anyway it's it's all just uh, laying down with the, the sepia so you still get the general idea of what's what's going on. <laughs> yeah, don't mind this facial expressions. Um, I sometimes concentrate with my uh, my tongue, stick my tongue out, and don't even know I'm doing it. But one thing I do, which you might notice, is um, when I go into lay some really fine detail down, and I want to 
steady hand is I'll actually hold my breath while I'm laying down the line. Um, it just it just helps me to, to remain steady. So I think I've said this before, um, if I'm trying to produce a straight line, a horizontal straight line, I do struggle quite a lot. Um, I'm not quite as smooth with the, the muscle memory, but when it comes to a vertical line, um, I've got, I feel like I've got a fair bit of control over that and I can you know, pull some really tight, fluent lines. Uh, so yeah, I do have to really concentrate whenever I'm trying to do detail um, you know, horizontal line detail. But again, in you know, in a piece like this, it's it's not real crucial that I get, you know, to be honest, it's probably better that I get a straight line in stuff like this because you know, it, this is all about texture. So, you know, keeping the airbrush moving, keeping the air on, um, and just back and forth with the the trigger, just uh, adding paint. You know, just uh, Keep keeping the paint going on and off, just creating patterns and textures, and it just really adds to the effect to make it look like um, an old weathered skin that um, kind of shows in the, in the reference. You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of texture in the reference, so just I'm trying to replicate that as much as I can um, you know, without trying to copy it exactly because otherwise you're going to be there pulling your hair out trying to get everything exact it's, uh, you know, as close as I can get it is uh, is fine with me I feel this is uh, after these heads were laid in this is where the picture really started to come to life um, I really started to started to get excited about the whole piece now because yeah this this just really really complemented the you know the Payne's grey that I've been using um, for all the other videos it just really really um, the contrast is just so cool um, even better when the uh, orange mix gets washed over this which um, you'll see in the the subsequent, video, subsequent videos that I'm editing at the moment. But um, this video, part six, is, is all about laying down that foundation, laying down those details and getting the, the base image blocked in, uh, ready to start adding more detail and, and then ultimately some colour. So rather than adding colour while I'm going, uh, I thought it best that I um, I dust the colour over top of this uh, just to just to complement the whole uh, base colour. So there's still a fair bit, bit to go to darken these up so like I've mentioned before I, I've kept it light so that um, I can step back take a look at the whole piece and think to myself does this need to go darker or is it fine as it is and generally I'm, I'm, I usually darken up a bit more than, um, than what I think um, and it's kind of hard to tell until you get all the, the rest of the image done how the contrast is going to work but um, it definitely needs to go darker at this stage and uh, keeping the lights fine because um, it you know I can always darken it up a little bit later uh, even after the um, the orange mix has been laid on I can still come in and darken up uh, especially areas like that around the bottom of the cheek you know you can really you go over the the top coat the orange and um, just really really block those areas in 
and it just creates so much depth and um, really gives you the 3D effect. Right. Little bits like that, that's where um, practicing your dagger strokes comes in really handy. Um, so I'm trying to emulate the, the fibers on rope. So it's a lot of little, little uh, flicks, little sharp dagger strokes with the airbrush. Um, which I can come in and, and tidy up with the um, the scratching technique anyway, uh, if I need to. But um, I try to do as much as I can with the airbrush because um, I'm, you know, I'm kind of lazy. Um, but also, as I've mentioned before, erasing details sometimes actually doesn't it doesn't look right because it just looks a little bit too sharp and out of place. So um, you know, if I can use the airbrush to do it, and it just keeps in with the general. Um, feel of the picture, you know, keeps it kind of soft and um, blends well. So again, that right hand side um, of, of his head, the severed head, so his right hand side is going to be predominantly blue um, because of the, the the light source coming from the left, which is um, would be the moonlight. So that's going to have a blue with a hint of uh, the red violet coming through which will really help to to blend that across into the the armor so it help, really helps with the transition You can really see how dark that sepia gets. It's uh, such a good colour to use. And you'll uh, you'll see how well the the orange works over top of it as well. 